Hello, I'm Lee Williams with Williamson Medical Center Foundation, and I welcome you today to the second program in our series of Embracing Women's Health. We're going to hear from Dr. Heather Roop today regarding women's health uh, in the four stages of life. We're sorry that this looks a little differently because of the pandemic, but we are happy to be able to share this information with you. So I'm gonna give the program over to Dr. Roop and enjoy. As Lee mentioned, I'm Dr. Heather Roop at the Women's Group of Franklin, and I've been in practice in Franklin, Tennessee for the past 15 years, and I've had the privilege to serve as Vice Chief of Staff for the last seven here at Williamson Medical Center. Thanks so much for having me here with you today. So excited to talk about women's health through all ages because that's not at all a broad topic. <laughs> so don't worry, we're not gonna take this too long, but I'm gonna hit just the key elements at each, at each phase of life, the things that you're really important to know um, to keep you as healthy as possible. Now this talk was supposed to look a lot different. Um, I was supposed to have a fresh haircut and a new facial, but as we all know, things are a little bit different. So I'm just happy to not be wearing a mask right now until you can actually see my, I think this is the first time I've worn lipstick in the last eight weeks. So that's fun as well. So we're just gonna make the best of this and hopefully by getting this online, we'll be able to reach even more people and more women will see this and be able to make some healthy choices that will hopefully impact their health for the better. So as with everything, let's always try to find the positive um, at each age group, we're going to go through and talk about the things that um, they can, that women can do to improve their health. So we're going to talk about what their doctors, what kind of tests that their doctors need to be doing at each age group, um, what um, exercises or what kind of supplements they need to be taking, and what are the key symptoms or problems that we're just gonna see in each age group of women. And I took the age groups, I just based this on what we use in the American College of OBGYN as far as kind of how we break up our different screening tests. So um, as we go through this, I'll remind you that I did not make up these, these titles for these different age groups. Now the first is adolescence. So I myself have an adolescent and I deal with a lot of adolescents in my practice and I know that this can sometimes be a challenging time for both the moms and the teen daughters. Um, so what are the key things that we really need, that our adolescents really need to be doing for preventative care? One of my biggest passions is talking about the HPV vaccine. Um, we always talk about how we want to cure cancer and the thing is, is we actually have a vaccine that doesn't just cure cancer, it prevents cancer from even, even starting. It prevents precancer and all the sequelae that go along with that. Um, it's recommended to give the HPV vaccine between the ages of 11 to 26. Um, the vaccine prevents up to 97% of cervical, vaginal, and vulvar cancers. And the big, and that's a huge, huge issue. Um, not just preventing those cancers though, is that it prevents precancer changes. Because the actual rate of cervical cancer in the states is, and is pretty low, but what we do see is about 400 to 500,000 women a year get painful surgeries or invasive procedures to remove portions of their uh, cervix and uterus that, that we do to prevent the cancer from progressing. So a lot of women get this precancer changes and this HPV prevents that as well. A lot of my mom's teenage daughters say, but yeah, I hear a lot of crap on the internet about the HPV vaccine. Isn't it dangerous? And the answer is it is not any more dangerous than any other vaccine, which means it is not very dangerous at all. So the risk of a major complication from the HPV vaccine, looking at the different data, some data so show that it's about one in 250,000. Most data show it's actually about one in two million risk of a major complication. So it's extremely rare to have a major complication from the HPV vaccine. What we do know is if you don't get the HPV vaccine, your chance of getting HPV somewhere in your 20s, between your 20s and 30s is around 65 to 70%. So you have 70% of getting HPV without the vaccine, or if you get the vaccine, you have about, about one and a half a million risk of a complication. To me, it's a no-brainer. My oldest son has already got his vaccine. My youngest is about to get it because he'll be old enough soon. So yes, strongly recommend this HPV vaccine in this age group and getting it as soon as possible because the, ideally you want to get it before there's any type of sexual activity has occurred. Um, next thing, the adolescents, this is hard for us moms to think about, but we do see a pretty high prevalence of sexually transmitted infection. Right now, among, among sexually active teenage girls, the rate of chlamydia is about eight to 10%, and I really hate chlamydia. Well, not that I don't hate all sexually transmitted infections, but chlamydia especially because it's, 
it um, doesn't have a whole lot of symptoms. So a lot of like gonorrhea, you'll have the, a lot of discharge, you know, herpes, you get the painful lesions, but chlamydia is pretty silent. Sometimes girls get some discharge and pain, but a lot of times they don't have any symptoms at all, but it can, it can cause a long-term infection that can damage fallopian tubes, lead to infertility, and a lot of pain and issues later in life. So it kind of sets in in the teenage years and it can kind of creep in and cause problems. So um, all sexually active teen girls need to have a STD screening at least once a year or if they've had new partners. Mood disorders, eating disorders, we see a lot of eating disorders in our teenage patients and a lot of times the first symptom of that can be irregular cycles. So when they're not uh, eating properly that can affect their period so that's one key thing as an OBGYN I'm always looking at. Now, under the age of 21, they do not need a pap smear. Now, that doesn't mean they don't need to have an exam, and we'll talk about that in just a second, but they don't necessarily need to start their pap smears until age 21. And then usually we recommend, people are always like, well, when do they need to come to the gyne, when do I need to bring my daughter to the gynecologist? And in general, we recommend um, if they're not having any other issues, somewhere between 13 and 17, it's good just to have an intro visit so they can at least meet us and talk about any issues that they have. And we can make sure they're caught up in their vaccines and make sure that they don't have any concerns about contraception or anything else. But some of the things that they would need to truly come to the doctor for, so I always tell moms, they need to bring their daughters to the gynecologist either age 21 um, or if they're having problems or if they're sexually active. So some of the problems that we will see in our teenagers are one would be abnormal puberty. So a big common question we get is, you know, when should my daughter start her period? So somewhere between the ages of 10 and 17 is when girls should normally start their period. So if they're 10 year, if they're if they're eight or nine and they're starting their period, then that you definitely should see your pediatrician or your OBGYN for that. If they're 17 and they haven't started their period yet, that's also concerning. Um, or if they're 14 and they show no signs of all of puberty. So if they're 14 and they have no no breast development, no pubic hair, then that and no sign of their period, then that's also when they should come in and see the provider. Painful periods, and I'll talk about this in the other age groups as well. Um, your period, it's, it's normal to have some mild cramping. You know, women who have some mild cramps, they take some ibuprofen, they feel a little crummy for a couple of days and push through, then that's okay. But if girls, especially young girls, if they are home with a heating pad for two or three days having to miss school, having to miss their sports events because their cramps are so severe, that is not normal. And I think a lot of people think that that's normal for teenagers, but it's really not. Um, so if, they're, if your daughter or if you're a teenager that's having that symptom, definitely that's something you want to talk to your provider about. If they, if they have trouble inserting tampons, this is another common thing that we see uh, young girls if they're not able to insert tampons. A lot of moms assume, oh, that's just because you know they're nervous about it or whatever, but lots of times that can be a sign of some type of abnormal anatomy. So if their um, hymenal ring didn't form properly, or sometimes women can have abnormal vaginal septums, then that will often show as the first symptom of that. If they're having trouble or difficulty inserting a tampon, they should probably see a gynecologist. Um, we mentioned symptoms of STIs and also contraception. Um, right now, with some really good news, because we'll, we'll take any good news that we can right now, we are actually seeing the lowest rate of teen pregnancy and the lowest rate of teen abortion that we've seen since the 1940s. And a big reason for that is our current um, availability of LARC contraception. So what that means is long-acting reversible contraception. So now our first-line contraception for adolescents and young adults are things like IUDs and implants. There's an implant that goes in the arm called a Nexplanon, and both the implant and the IUDs are one-time insertion so the girls don't have to remember it, um, doesn't interact with any other medications, and it's they're both 99.9% .9 effective and can be reversible and their fertility go completely back to normal when they're ready to have fertility again. So that's been very effective and the fact that that's now covered by insurance um, has made our rate of teen pregnancy extremely low right now, so that's a good thing. And it's good to know that those are safe options for teenagers as well. So what are some healthy things that teenagers need to be doing to to keep um, to be healthy through the ages, and one of the and with, you know there's a lot of different. It can be confusing the number of different supplements or the number of different people who are telling you to take different supplements. So I just went with the 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 recommendations that all the different organizations agreed on as far as when I talk about the different supplements for each age group. And the key thing for our teenagers or for adolescents is calcium. So they need to be getting at least 1,300 milligrams of calcium, and that can be a combination of diet and supplements. 
This is a key time of building bones. So the amount of exercise and calcium intake that, they're, that they have in their adolescent years is going to translate to stronger bones once we hit menopausal years. And we'll get, we'll get to menopausal years in about 15 minutes. But we really see the impact of that calcium and exercise now, long term, as they get older to help keep stronger bones. Folic acid, all women of childbearing age are recommended to, to get at least 400 micrograms of folic acid a day. Um, the key thing with folic acid is that it's something that's actually better absorbed as a supplement than from food, which is unusual. Most obviously nutrients are better absorbed from foods than they are supplements, but we see with folic acid it's actually better absorbed from a supplement. So usually you would want to make sure they're at least getting folic acid and calcium. Um, this can usually be a you can get this from just getting a regular multivitamin, but if you didn't if they didn't want to take a full multivitamin, then that you could get some combination of those two. All women should get at least 30 minutes of aerobic exercise a day, and that's aerobic, that's where you're engaging your bones, and so not just swimming, but engaging your bones, and then also um, exercising enough that you're getting your heart rate up. So I always tell people to count it as true aerobic exercise, you need to be breathing heavy to the point where you're kind of having to take a few deep breaths here and there, and that's, that's what we're gonna count as the 30 minutes of continuous exercise. And then obviously no alcohol or tobacco products are recommended in this age group. Next age group they're going to talk about is reproductive age. And this is a really wide range uh, that we're seeing. You know, there's a lot of life changes that go on between 21 and 45. Um, so there's a lot of different issues and stuff that come up during this age group. And this is honestly the great majority of women that we're seeing in our practice. Um, so this is when we do start seeing women for yearly exams. So we do recommend coming for annual well women checkup starting at age 21. Now, this is also when we start doing pap smears. And we are gonna, we currently base the pap smear on the risk factors. So whereas used to the recommendation was everybody gets a pap smear every year no matter what, now we're customizing that to the needs of the women. So some women do need a pap smear every year. Um, some women do not. Some women need it a little less frequently based on their risk factors. Now, we still recommend a checkup every year because we're not just doing a pap smear, we're checking for a lot of other things at the Well Woman exam, and your risk factors for cervical cancer can change. So while three years ago you may have not needed, you may have been low risk, some things in your life may have changed that made you a little higher risk for cervical cancer, so now you may need a pap smear. And those things are readdressed each year at your annual checkup. Um, this is also a time to get the HPV vaccine. I mentioned that it's recommended specifically up to age 26, but we also now are doing catch-ups up to age 45. So the newer data in the U.S. is it's FDA approved up to age 45. So if you're going to be having more sexual partners or if there's concern for risk for HPV, then we're recommending to get the HPV vaccine up to age 45. Um, colon cancer screening, we recommend to start colon cancer specifically at age 50, but we're not actually, if someone has uh, unusual symptoms or if they have other risk factors like a family history of colon cancer, then we're doing the colonoscopies or screenings earlier. And then also African American women, it's recommended that they start screening at age 45 regardless of their risk factors. Um, breast exams is done yearly with your annual exam and then mammograms, we start those at age 40 um, regardless of um, uh, well, we start them at age 40 if they have no history, but if you do have a family history of risk factors, then those may be started earlier as well. So usually we like to start those 10 years before the first relative. So if no one in your family's had breast cancer or if all the women were over 50, then we'll start at age 40. But if someone in your family had breast cancer at 42, 45, then we would start, it early, start your screenings earlier than that. Um, another thing I'm really passionate about is genetic testing. Um, just like how the HPV vaccine can prevent cancer, genetic counseling and testing can actually prevent cancer as well. So what we see is in these families where we have multiple women who have breast cancer or colon cancer or ovarian cancer, sometimes it, this can be tied to a genetic syndrome. So in women who have a strong family history, what we're going to do is we're going to have them sit down with the genetic counselor and see if they meet the criteria and if so they can have uh, testing to see if they're carrier of the gene. Now, if they are carrier of the gene, that can put their risk of, of for sure getting breast or ovarian cancer by up to 10 to 20% depending on the type of gene and their specific risk factors, which may help them make decisions to be more aggressive with having preventative treatments. So again, this is something that women can do to really be proactive with their health. I think sometimes it's scary to have that information um, for some women. They're like, gosh, I don't know if I'd want to know if I'm going to get cancer. Um, I see 
Infor you know, information is power. The more we know, the more th things we can do to prevent and be proactive to prevent you from getting cancer. So while there are definitely things to take into consideration, I strongly encourage women to cons consider that and think of it as an empowering thing and not a scary thing. What are some reproductive age issues? Um, what are not reproductive age issues? We see a lot of different problems in this age group. Um, menstrual problems, so heavy menstrual bleeding, painful periods, um, contraception and pre-camp, it seems like everybody's either wanting to get pregnant or wanting not to get pregnant. So we have, um, we like to see people for both issues and we have great, uh, like I mentioned, we have great methods of reversible contraception, um, great different options now, more than we've ever had. Uh, a lot of PMS, um, pelvic pain, I mentioned cramping with your periods. If any type of pain is happening during the month, pain with intercourse, pain with ovulation, pain with your menstrual cycle, if any of those pains are affecting your activities, then you should definitely talk to your doctor about it. Now, everybody's gonna get a little twingy here and there. That's, it's normal to have some occasional occasional mild pains, but anything that's causing you to take ibuprofen regularly, affect your activities, you know, I'm not going to stay home, I'm hurting this time of the month, or I don't want to have intercourse because I'm having pain, those, that, those are type of things that are not normal. You should definitely be talking to your doctor about. Um, that could be signs of things like endometriosis, uh, fibroids, um, we also deal a lot with PCOS. These are different issues that come up during this age group that we can definitely address. So one of the big questions I always get is what you know, or what's a normal period? Well, actually, I don't get this question. I think a lot of women just assume that whatever their period is normal because most, well, I talk to women about their periods all day, but most average women do not talk to other people and know what other people's periods are like, so they just assume that theirs are normal. Um, on any given day, I'll have a patient come in, how are your, and I'm asking them, how are your cycles? And they're like, oh yeah, they're, they're normal. And then I've learned wisely over the years to ask, okay, well, what's normal for you? And I'll have some patients say, oh, you know, I, it's only three days that I can't leave the house because of how heavy I'm bleeding, you know, and having to wear two or three pads at a time because of the blood. And I only have to get my iron transfusions two or three times a year now for my bleeding. Um, obviously that's not normal. Or you have people who say, oh, my periods are terrible, they're just so heavy. And I'm like, okay, well, how often are you changing your tampon? Oh, like twice a day. And I'm like, no, that's, that's actually pretty good. So I like this uh, Sally Ride quote here um, when she was going up into space and the NASA asked the NASA scientists were trying to figure out how many tampons she needed because that, you know, they can do rocket science, but I guess gynecology is, is, was a little harder and they asked her if she needed about 100 and she's like, no, I do not need 100 tampons for a week. So if you are needing 100, if you're buying uh, all your tampons at Costco every month for, for one cycle, then that is not normal and definitely want to talk to your doctor about it. So what is a normal period? So cycles should last from the start of one period, when we measure from the day one to day one, so from the start of one period to the start of the next period should be anywhere between 21 and 35 days. And it can vary a few days. Um, it may be 28 days one month, it may be 32 days, and that's okay. A lot of people get freaked out if it's even a day off. Or some people get really concerned if it's not the same day of the month, but not taking into account that each month has a different number of days in it. So um, especially February always throws women off, you know, when there's like three less days in the month. But anyway, it should be the it should be the actual days from the start of one to the start of the next. And average is about five days. Um, if you're bleeding up to seven, as long as it's light, that's okay. Or obviously, if it's less than five, then that's okay. But um, average is about five days, and it should be heavy, you know, for a day or two. And what we would consider kind of on the higher end of normal would be if you're changing a pad about every two to three hours, but that should only last for about a day or two, and then it should lighten up after that. So if it's much heavier than that, then definitely talk to your doctor. Um, blood clots. People get very concerned with blood clots, but usually blood clots just mean that your blood is functioning normal and it's, and it's clotting. Um, but if you're having really large clots, especially if they're causing pain, then that would be concerning. And then again, your cramps should not be to the point where they're causing you to stay home or miss activities. So what are some healthy things that you can do in this age group? Because this is a huge, this is the age group where a lot of, a lot of our uh, viewers are going to be. Um, I mentioned the folic acid. You, all women who are of reproductive age should be getting at 400 micrograms of folic acid a day as long as they have the ability to reproduce. So if you've had your tubes tied or if your partner's had a vasectomy, you don't necessarily need to be on the folic acid. But anyone who's on folic acid, you should be, you need to be on folic acid before you conceive, or you, being on folic acid before you conceive reduces your risk of spina bifida and other birth defects by up to 50%. So 
tiny little pill, easy to take, and usually, and it's in all women's multivitamins. Um, one on, so you definitely want to be on the folic acid regularly. Calcium, you want in this age group, you need a thousand milligrams a day between your diet and your um, supplements, and again, that's to help prevent osteoporosis. Vitamin D, a lot of people are very focused on vitamin D this, these days, but you need about 800 units of vitamin D a day, and you don't need your vitamin D level checked unless you have other risk factors for osteoporosis. So in this age group, 21 to 45, do not necessarily need your vitamin D check, but you do need to be taking vitamin D every day. Um, limiting your alcohol to one drink a day, and that is an average of six ounces um, a day. Now, I know during the corona, there's a lot of memes going around about alcohol, and there's probably been a little bit more than one drink a day in several households uh, during, this, during the pandemic and during the quarantine. But I think it's helpful to remember that really the healthy amount is only one drink a day. So if you're drinking more than that, that's on a regular basis, that's probably not ideal. And so as things are passed, as you know, this quarantine is getting longer and as things are releasing, I think it's really important for us to kind of get back on a little, a little healthier attitude and a little healthier approach to alcohol. Um, I think our society kind of embraces, um, you know, the mommy needs her wine and you know, all the wine down Wednesday and all the little memes and they're funny. And I think there's, there's, you know, definitely um, a place for a glass of wine and a friendly, friendly night out with friends. Oh, someday when we have our night out with friends to drink wine, we'll look forward to that. But I think it's just a helpful reminder that that the average recommended is no more than one ounce, or not sorry, six ounces of wine a day. And I think it's, oh, I think it's two ounces of, of liquor. I'll have to look. I'd have to look that up. But um, but just to be just to be a little cautious of that. Again, exercise, there should be no excuse during this beautiful weather while we've been quarantined not to be at least getting out walking 30 minutes a day. Um, exercise, during, of course, I'm a big exercise proponent, but that's going to be helpful for a lot of the different symptoms that we talked about as well. Exercising daily is going to reduce your PMS symptoms. It's going to help with symptoms of PCOS. It's going to help with mood. It's going to help with metabolism. It's going to help prevent osteoporosis. So we should all be getting out, engaging our muscles 30 minutes a day. And then sugar limiting to 25 grams a day, which is really only six teaspoons. And I think this is the one that I have the hardest time with. Um, even though I try to be super healthy, I eat my fruits and vegetables, I get an exercise, but I really like cookies because they taste so good. But I think it's really helpful to think about how much sugars we're really getting in in our diet, in this American diet, and how much that, that leads into obesity, which is a whole other talk in and of itself. Um, but really looking at how much sugar we're getting in our diet. And if you're struggling with um, weight, if you're struggling with PCOS, really the very first step is just counting those sugars and make sure you're getting down to the 25 grams a day and getting that 30 minutes of exercise. So if you're doing nothing else to improve your health, if you're, if you're, if you're really trying to cut back, really check really cut back on that sugar and increase your exercise. Now mature women, that I love this uh, love this category because uh, I'm pretty much there. Uh, mature women is 64, or 46 to 64. And I saw this uh, funny uh, picture at a, a little shop I went to recently back, you know, back when we were shopping. It said menopause because nature decided that PMS, pregnancy, labor and delivery, breastfeeding, stretch marks, saggy boobs and cellulite were just not enough. Um, so I thought that was uh, pretty funny. And really, a lot of women, I know a lot of women get scared about menopause, or a lot of women start blaming, blaming their problems on menopause, um, probably about starting about age 35. Women come in and they're having some problem, they're like, I'm sure it's perimenopause. Like, they, like I, they start dreading it and start blaming things on menopause way early. But really, um, the main symptoms of the main symptoms of perimenopause, menopause will will be irregular cycles. So if you're having regular cycles each month, then you're probably not perimenopausal. So usually like mid 40s, we see women, their cycles start to space out. They start skipping cycles here and there. Occasional hot flash, occasional night sweats. Those symptoms kind of wax and wane usually for two to three years and then kind of get a little worse. And then once once they go a full year with that period, a period, then that would be considered menopausal. And the average age of menopause is 52. And usually we start seeing the symptoms kind of late 40s. So if you're 40 and your cycles are regular each month, you probably can't quite blame your problems on perimenopause just yet. And my, let me reassure you too, I, I would say about 80% of my patients cruise through menopause, perimenopause with very few issues. Um, a little bit, like I said, a little bit of hot flashes, a little bit of night sweats, 
kind of push on through. But, um, but about 10 to 20% do need some type of um, hormonal or, um, or herbal therapy to help with their symptoms. But the great majority cruise through just fine. I think it's just the ones that have a, a difficult time with it that kind of scare everybody else. But most women, it's not, it's not a huge deal. Um, and if it is, we got, we got some things to help you with that, but I don't, I don't, let's not blame everything on menopause and let's not be too scared of it. Um, we'll notice as we get these a little bit older age groups that are preventative and our, um, screen our concern our preventative tests getting a little bit longer because we're starting to see more medical issues so we still recommend annual exams and pap smears in this age group and again this is going to be based on the risk factors and then this is where we're going to see colon cancer screening more regularly so we do recommend everybody starting at age 50 and then usually depending on your risk factors about every 10 years after that now colonoscopy is still the gold standard for colon cancer screening but we do have some other options because i have some patients who are just not going to get a colonoscopy um, they're just the idea of that, even though it shouldn't be scary um, for some women, they're just like, that's just not gonna happen for them. So we have a newer option out called the Cologuard. And what that is, is actually a stool, you give us, you give us, you produce, at, well, you just, you basically you poop in a bucket at home and you mail it into the lab and they analyze the poop and they look at that for some and they are able to look at the stool sample and determine if you have risk factors for cancer so they look at the actual dna particles that can come from the cancer it's in the stool and it's actually a pretty good test um, it's not as good as colonoscopy but if it's normal then it's very reassuring now if it's abnormal you'd still have to go on and get a colonoscopy but for women who who say that colonoscopy is just not for them um, then that would be at least something to consider it's better, it's better than doing nothing. We do recommend yearly mammograms and yearly breast exams. Um, you know, it's a, it's a little bit controversial because each different organization is recommending something different for mammograms. So you have some organizations who recommend starting at age 50, you have some recommending starting at age 40, you have some people who recommend getting them every other year. Um, we still at the American College of OBGYN recommend the yearly mammogram starting at age 40. And that's based on the fact that Again, the earlier you detect, the less, the less um, invasive treatments you're gonna need for your breast cancer. So I still encourage my women. Now some, again, this should be a personalized decision though. Some people may be at low risk and may prefer to go less often. And I always say, you know, let, let's make these decisions together. I'm never gonna, women are always like, are you gonna make me get my mammogram? No, I'm not gonna make you do anything, but I'm, we're gonna work together to find out what your preference is and what works best for your, for your health situation. Um, mentioned the genetic testing and then osteoporosis screening is starting we recommend that at age 65 or younger of risk factors but i find that a lot of my women do have risk factors because risk factors are going to include weight under 130 pounds um, caucasian um, being on uh, steroids for a long period of time or certain other long-term medical conditions this is what we're going to want to do earlier screening and the osteoporosis screening is pretty simple it's just literally kind of like laying down and get an x-ray. And this is also when we're start, going to start screening for heart disease, thyroid disease, and diabetes, even in populations that aren't that don't have risk factors. If someone has risk factors for this, we're going to start way earlier. But if not, we're going to start screening of those around age 45. What are some mature women's issues? Well, I mentioned the perimenopause, menopause issues. Um, the other thing we're going to start to see is, again, the heart disease, um, which is going to be associated with high cholesterol, um, thyroid disease, diabetes. Pelvic floor dysfunction. Now, it is not normal to pee on yourself when you cough or sneeze or exercise. Now, it is very common, but it is not normal. But this is kind of the age group where we start to see these symptoms show up. Um, what happens is that childbirth stretches out the pelvic muscles. Age, gravity causes your bladder, your rectum, your your uterus to drop, creating pressure on your pelvic floor, and that causes that to be weaker. So when you have coughing or sneezing, it causes you to leak urine. Um, some of the first things you can do to help with that is weight loss. If you're overweight, that the, especially if you're overweight in your abdomen, that extra pressure pushes on your bladder and can cause Ex, even pushing on the pelvic muscles even more. So weight loss is a big thing. And then pelvic floor exercises. So we actually have pelvic floor physical therapists that can help strengthen those pelvic muscles and make them stronger to hold up your bladder. Um, so women who, uh, you know, who are having this issue, 
lots of times they're like, oh, I don't want a surgery. But lots of times we can get away with if weight loss and the pelvic floor exercise will really fix that for a lot of women. Now, if not, there's some great procedures we can do to help hold that up. But uh, usually the weight loss and the exercise are the first options for that, and that can be very helpful. Sexual dysfunction. Um, I spend a lot of time with women talking about issues with of low libido, of vaginal dryness, especially in this age group. Um, I think it helps a lot of women to know that just how common it is. They've looked at studies and about 40 to 50% of women over the age of 40 report zero libido. Um, and that's just kind of across the board. And that's pretty shocking a statistic for a lot of women because they feel like they're the only ones struggling with that. But I think, I've, I've heard sex therapists explain it this way, if you look at our primitive brain, uh, when life is stressful, so if you think back to caveman days, life is super stressful, there's a lot going on, therefore I don't need to have a baby. So women associate stress, their, their primitive brain, subconscious, stress equals low libido because they don't want to get, it's the association with pregnancy. Um, and what are our modern lives except one giant ball of stress. So I think that the understanding that and not, 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 not saying that you have to just accept that and that's and that, that has, has to be normal, but realizing that that is common, but there are different, now we do have different therapies and different treatment options, both hormonal, non-hormonal, um, prescription, non-prescription. There's been a lot of different options and breakthroughs in this area in the last 10 to 15 years. So definitely talk to your provider about it. Uh, but no, it is common, but it's also something that's super, that's super treatable. And lots of times it's just a matter of, of understanding that, that, that's, that that's okay and that that kind of will wax and wane with different, uh, different parts of your life. Health promotion. So these women, okay, our calcium recommendation is back up to 1,200 milligrams in this age group because, again, we are trying to build those bones strong. Because when that estrogen level drops with menopause, estrogen is what kind of helps hold, helps those bones hold together, that calcium. So now that estrogen is dropping, we start to see bone loss, and that's why we start to look at osteoporosis in this age group. Again, we want the vitamin D. We want to limit alcohol. Excess alcohol has also been shown to um, increase your risk of osteoporosis. Exercise, again, limiting your sugar. And this is for, those are for all age groups. Okay, so our last age group is for women over the age of 64. And I like how they didn't even try to come up with like a nice, you know, name for these women. They're just like women over 64. So I'm gonna call these women over 64 the Betty Whites because they're kind of, they're super awesome and feisty. So these, so my Austin feisty, feisty uh, women over 64, this is what they're looking at for their health issues um, specifically related to women's health. So what kind of screenings do they need to get? Now they still need to recommend to get yearly checkups. So as part of the yearly checkups, kind of in this age group, we're talking looking for different issues for them and making sure things are going okay. Now they may not need a pap smear over age 65. Um, looking at their different risk factors. Now if they've had an abnormal pap history, if they've had HPV in the past, then we will usually continue pap smears. But if they've always had normal pap smears, then they may not need them over 65. Now, if they want their pap smears, a lot of my Betty Whites, they want their pap smears. And so I am not gonna argue with them because I've learned that you should not argue with women over 65. They know their bodies, they know what they want. And so I will counsel them, but if they want their pap smears, they can definitely have them. Um, but if you really look at the statistics, they would be at much lower risk for cervical cancer for, than most women. Um, colon cancer screenings recommended to continue up to age 85. Mammograms is recommended as long as they're in good health. And this is still an age group where we still recommend the genetic screening. Um, a lot of these women really understand that the testing for them is real. Yes, they want to know, but they also want to know for their daughters and their granddaughters. So if they find out that they're the that their genetic testing is negative, then they know that that's reassuring for the for their daughters and granddaughters, and vice versa. If it's positive and they do find that they have that higher risk of genetic cancer genetic cancers in their family, then they can know that for the other generations. Um, and again, we're worried about osteoporosis in this age group. Um, what are some issues that we see? Um, again, this is a, a age group where we're seeing a lot of heart disease, we're seeing a lot of thyroid disease and diabetes. Um, pelvic floor dysfunction. So both pelvic floor, you know, these things that I talked about in the mature age group, um, these are starting to get worse in these women over 64 because we have gravity, age, these things are also taking effect. And then also, the further past menopause we get, we get, uh, issues with vaginal thinning and vaginal dryness. So the vagina has a lot of estrogen receptors in it. So as you as your estrogen levels go down after menopause, that tissue can get 
thinner and it's and it's and it doesn't have as much blood flow and so we see that worsening for the pelvic floor so in these women often in addition to the weight loss and the pelvic floor exercise will often add in vaginal estrogen to help thicken that tissue and help uh, improve the blood flow we also see this for uh, this age group will often have a lot of pain and dryness with intercourse which we now have a lot more treatments than we used to have um, but really the main best treatment is just replacing the estrogen vaginally because giving the estrogen vaginally we don't have to worry about any of the other side effects uh, because it's not flowing to the rest of their body but by giving it vaginally we can improve that blood flow and really um, it's one of the really makes a difference in a lot of these women's lives because after about two or three months of using this vaginal estrogen, I'll see these women go from having a 65-year-old vagina to like looking like a 40-year-old vagina. I mean, it really improves the blood flow. The You can see the color change from this pale white to this normal red color. A very, makes a huge, huge improvement in these women's quality of life. Um, and then also osteoporosis is the big thing that we're gonna worry about in this age group. Um, so we want to make sure that they are um, getting their screenings for and taking their calcium, their vitamin D. Um, in this age group, you're looking at, again, the 1,200 of calcium, the 800, limiting their alcohol because A, it makes their osteoporosis worse, and we don't want them to fall because if they fall and they have early osteoporosis, they're likely to break a hip, which is going to affect their um, health on all their levels. Again, trying to get them, trying to get exercise daily, trying to limit the sugar, um, keeping a healthy weight. Thank you, Dr. Roop. That was incredible. Lots and lots of great information. And I had some questions that were asked from some women in the community. Uh -huh. Gail asks, how does OBGYN care look differently during the pandemic? Um, well, this has obviously been a challenging time for everyone, and it's hard to know how we should approach our care. Uh, for the past six weeks, when we've been sheltering at home, obviously we've been seeing just very minimal patients in the office, just our OB care and our more emergent more emergent gynecology cases. Um, now we're starting to see a little bit more patients and what I'm actually seeing is a lot of people have maybe been sitting on things at home that they probably should have came in for a little bit earlier. Um, so I would just encourage patients, if you're having persistent pain, um, if you're having abnormal bleeding, some of the things we talked about in the, in the in the talk, you know, go ahead and give us a call and come on in for that. We're both in in our office and in the emergency rooms. We're taking extreme precautions in order to, to keep things clean, in order to keep things people away from each other and do our social distancing. So that is a safe place for you to come in and get care. Great. Um, Stacy asks, what are the treatment options to abnormal periods? Okay. Well, as we talked about a lot in the talk, there is no reason that you should live your life around your period. So if your period is causing you to stay home um, due to either the amount of bleeding or the amount of pain, definitely talk to your doctor about that. Um, we have some very easy treatments um, that a lot of people are kind of shocked at how simple um, from doing a progesterone IUD, which is something that can be placed in the office uh, with minimal discomfort, and that usually reduces both pain and bleeding by up to 90%. Um, there's procedures called endometrial ablation, where we go in and laser the lining of the uterus to reduce the amount of bleeding. That's also can be very effective for a lot of women. Um, we have minimally invasive hysterectomies, which a lot of women get scared by the word hysterectomy. Um, but Currently, most of the time, we're able to conserve women's ovaries so that they don't have to go through menopause in order to not have periods anymore. So their hormones are still the same. They just don't have that pain and bleeding each month with their cycle. So a lot of women are very, um, very appreciative of, of how that improves their quality of life, as well as multiple different medical um, you know, medicines that they can take to help reduce their, sure. their menstrual flow or their bleeding. Okay. What are some of the best treatments for menopausal symptoms? That question comes from Hillary. Hillary, yes, this is a common question I get. Usually, um, we like to start with easy. So I always like to start with diet exercise changes in you know, reducing your caffeine, reducing your alcohol, dressing in layers, um, trying to get enough sleep, trying to exercise daily. As I've talked about through the talk, I like really promote the exercise as, as one of your key treatments. If that doesn't work, you go to herbal therapies. Um, black cohosh is something that's available over the counter that's, that can be very effective for some women. Um, there's also a, a herbal supplement called um, Relizin that you can order that a lot of my patients have found very, very helpful. Um, if those things don't work, then you can go to either hormonal or non-hormonal medical therapies. 
Um, so we do have a lot more options than we used to. I have a lot of patients, um, a lot of patients just need very minimal, but again, we start with the, we start with the least invasive and then kind of work up from there. Okay. Which forms of contraception affect weight gain? Ah, uh, everybody's favorite question. <laughs> For the way, nobody wants to get pregnant or gain weight. Well, some people want to get pregnant, but a lot of them don't. A lot of, and if they don't, they don't want to gain weight with that. Um, now, I always tell people not everyone's body reads the package insert on how they're supposed to respond to medications. But so every once in a while I have somebody who will gain weight on a pill or a certain contraception that they, we don't see in the studies. But looking at 99% of women, the current dosing of our oral contraceptives or regular birth control pill does not cause weight gain. IUDs do not cause weight gain. Um, the next planon, the implant in the arm does not cause weight gain. Sometimes with the Depo-Provera shot, we do see some weight gain with that in the studies. Um, but the great majority of the current contraceptive methods that we have today do not, and tubal ligations do not cause weight gain at all, or removing the fallopian tubes does not cause weight gain. Um, so most of our current forms of contraception do not cause weight gain. Okay. So Melissa wants to know if she gets pregnant, when does she need to start going to the doctor? Um, would like you to call, especially what we want, I'd like people to call right away when they get pregnant so that we can base their first visit on their specific risk factors and make sure we get them in at the right time. It's actually ideal if they come in before they get pregnant. We really like to do preconceptual visits. Um, that way we can sit down and go through their different health issues and make sure they're taking, you know, look at their medications, make sure they've had the right screening tests. So yes, call right away when you're pregnant, but in an ideal world, I'd love to see patients about three or four months even before they get pregnant so that we can kind of match maximize their health during that time. Oh, fantastic. Well, thank you so much for your information. Uh, if somebody wants to make an appointment, they want to come see you and learn more, how do they get in touch with you? Um, I'm at Women's Group of Franklin here in, here in uh, Williamson Medical Center, and our office number is 615-778-0010. They can also connect with us on our Facebook page at womensgrouperfranklin.com, or I have um, a women's health blog that I do for WebMD, so you can check that out. Um, I have links to that at our Women's Group of Franklin page as well. Oh, great. Thank you, Dr. You're Rope, welcome. so much. And thank you for joining us. And we'll look forward to seeing you in September when we talk about breast health. Have a good day.